All right. Hello, everybody. We are back here with the podcast formerly known as 100 Yards of Podcast. Um, I'm Marshall. You know Omar, of course. Uh, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the ACC and history repeating itself, and then we're going to move a little bit into uh, wide receivers winning the Heisman, and will we potentially ever see it again? Um, this show is brought to you by Catch App. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you want to start? Yeah, sure. So, um, first off, speaking of the ACC, let's uh, congratulate our boy uh, Trevor Lawrence on getting engaged. And, um, you know, it's just a shame that a bunch of internet trolls, especially like grown men trolling Trevor Lawrence, you know, a young guy, talking about he can, like, he has all the millions, he can play the field. Like, that's not what Trevor Lawrence is about. He's a man of God, you know, he's like myself. So, <laughs> he's not going to do that. But, uh, congratulations to him. I don't know, man. I just have to say, it seems a little bit off character for someone that dumbed themselves football Jesus to be getting married. I'm just saying, Jesus was never oh, that's married. A, that's no a good longer point. football Jesus. He might have to rebrand to Clemson, like the, Rem- the Remember the Titans character. <laughs> Dude, I saw this hilarious post. I think it was by PFT. He was like, I think I sent it to you, but it was when uh, the Redskins were like changing their name. He's like, they should change their name to the Washington Trevor Lawrence's. So that when the Jets try and draft him, they can just sue them for the rights. <laughs> That's genius. I, I, I didn't see that. I, I don't think the Jets are going to draft Trevor Lawrence. But, uh, I mean, Sam Darnold, I, I still think he's got loads of potential, but his receiving core is just bare. It's, it's just bare. It's actually interesting. I was reading this stat about it the other day, and it was like, so when games without him, obviously, you know, I think they lost, like, every game. They might have won one. But with him, like, their EPA per play, like, I think it went positive. Like their record swung, their record swung positive. I think in the, in the stretch he was back, I think they were they were over five hundred by a game. Like I think, yeah. you know, I think he has a lot more talent than people might give him credit for. Really, I do agree. Like he had some big wins last year. Like he beat the uh, the Cowboys. <laughs> like that one came out of nowhere for sure. Like I thought that was a fluke, but then they beat the Steelers later on, um, and then I think uh, the Raiders as well. Like they beat some good teams last like last year, but um, I think the Jets aren't going to do good in general because of Jamal Adams demanding a trade so anyways <laughs> anyways yeah <laughs> so um on to our first topic though talking we brought up Trevor Lawrence we were, talking, we were to talk about the ACC and um just about its history as a football conference so brief history lesson uh we'll go back to 1992 Florida State's first year in the ACC and um I'd always heard about how much of a big deal it was when Virginia finally beat uh, Florida State in the in ACC play it was their first loss in the ACC 1995. In fact, if you have NC football 04 and 05, they have the um, the college classics game modes where you can play historical modes, historical situations like the uh, 1980 Holiday Bowl with SMU or with SMU and BYU, BYU being down by three touchdowns, or the Cal Stanford play, the Doug Flutie Hail Mary. You get the gist. The fourth down play against Virginia is on one of those, and I was like, that's kind of weird. It seems like a random game. But if you take a step back and look at FSU's dominance in the ACC in the 90s, like it's it makes a lot of sense because. I'm going to ask you, Marshall, like, what do you think Florida State's record was in the ACC from 1992 to 1999? Sheesh, probably, let's see, the seven seasons, probably what, like? Uh, eight, many, eight many, seasons. Eight seasons, but how many conference yeah. games per year? Or, um, that'd be, we'll just call it, what, like eight? Call it eight. Yeah. I don't know, let's say they go seven and one. Let's call it, like, 50 wins-ish. They were actually uh, 70 and two from 1992 to 1999, which is amazing, an amazing streak of dominance. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you ever heard the parody song, Return of the Mac Brown, a couple of guys made a, a year ago, but um, there was a line in there that said Clemson's like old FSU. And it's becoming true because on the other hand with Clemson, they have no ACC losses since 2016, which is really astounding. It's really astonishing. Um, and I think in 2015, I don't think they lost a the game then. So if we're looking since 2016, it's like they play eight games a year. That's like five seasons. They're looking at, I think, 38-2 and two over the past five years. Um, and it would be 39-1 and one if uh, if Kelly Bryant didn't get hurt on the Friday night. I had to remember because that he, he's a forgotten guy for um, – sadly, I mean, after Trevor Lawrence got started over him. But um, I pose a question. Like, is this – is this good for the ACC to have like such elite teams and such a tradition of elite teams with almost no parity at the, um, in, in throughout the league, or is this like sort of damaging? Yeah. I mean, it's like, I think it depends kind of how you view, you know, a successful conference, right? If you just want to talk about, you know, the conference bringing in money, bringing in TV contracts, it probably is. 
you know, it's like probably great to have a team that's always competing for the national title. You know, whether or not they run over everyone else in your conference is another question, but it'll bring more eyeballs, more viewers, more money at the end of the day, right? But like you said, in terms of football parity, I would consider it, you know, probably one of the worst things you could have. You know, it's like, it's going to bring all the good recruits to one school. It's going to continue, like, widening that gap between those schools. You know, it's going to make them just non-competitive. It's like, why would you ever go and watch, you know, Clemson versus North Carolina, you know, despite how exciting that North Carolina team might be? Like, really? It's it's just hard to get yourself out to watch a game for that if you know you, the final score is going to be, you know, 50 to 7. Like, I think, I think it would help. I don't think you can ask Clemson to be worse, though, really, you know? I think you just kind of have to ask everyone else to get a little better, which is obviously, you know, every conference's goal is kind of like the toughest thing you can do, but I don't know any other way to put it. Yeah, I do agree with that. And I think like, I think it's, it's particularly damaging because you, you sort of like waste good teams on like the second level. Like um, that, like when it's just like one team carrying the conference, like uh, it's not like the SEC where you put like two, three teams, sometimes four into the new year six. It's like either that one team or bust. Like, um, if you look at in the past, the 2015 North Carolina with Marquise Williams, um, that was like one of the few like great teams that wasn't Clemson or FSU in this decade. They they got wasted at, just because. Well, I mean, it's partly their own fault because they lost in the, opening, in the opening game against South Carolina um, against a three and nine North Car- or South Carolina team that lost to the Citadel that year. That's their fault. But still, they still came to the, t- the ACC title game at 11 and one, and they end up going to the Camping World Bowl, or then whatever it was called, Russell Athletic Bowl against Baylor, who um, I think went nine and three in the Big Twelve, which is not a bad opponent. But any other conference, that team's in the New Year Six. Um, and then, like if you look like further back in the past, again, like I guess North Carolina is the prime example of this. Uh, they're great teams with Mac Brown. Uh, the 1997 team went 11 and one. They were sixth in the Bowl Alliance before the, which was before the BCS. They were, I think, fifth in the AP and seventh in the coaches. And they end up playing in the Gator Bowl on New Year's Day. It's New Year's Day Bowl, but it's against a 7-4 and four Big East school, the second-place team in the Big East. So it's like these teams deserve better, and it's just like there's never been a history of death, so these teams don't get better. Like they, don't, they don't get what they deserve in terms of bowl season, I think. It's interesting, though, too, to think about. So I pose you like – so take the conference like the American, right? Yeah. Where they have a ton of good – of really good teams, right? I mean, it's like, quite frankly, they're all good. However, they don't have that super elite team that's competing, you know, for the national title. Like, granted, I think they obviously are at a disadvantage, you know, given the power five versus group of five stance. Um, But if they had, you know, that that Alabama, that Clemson, that Florida State in there, like, I would argue that it potentially could bring more eyeballs to their conference, right? Like, I wonder what – so, like, how would you elevate a conference like that, right? So maybe it's important, too, you know, to have that really elite team, despite the fact, you know, they kind of overshadow everyone. Who knows, it could, it could, you know, add enough incremental value to all the other teams to negate, you know, what they lose in terms of that one team always beating them. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. But uh, I pose, like, sort of like a sample size in response to that with the American exa- exactly. Um, UCF in 2017 and 2018, winning um, 24 straight regular season games. And it's like you had that team for a while, but, I mean, it did little for the profile of the conference. I mean, it, it did some things for it. Like, granted, uh, UCF got a Saturday Night Football appearance, but um, it didn't do much for it. Like, people still said the Americans the American. They won 20. Like, like uh, it's like the goalposts kept moving for how a uh, group of five teams can make the playoff. It's like, okay, uh, you know, have some big wins against the Power Five teams, which, I mean, UCF had some good wins, but um, they weren't great. So, I mean, they couldn't really do stuff there. So, the next thing was, all right, dominate for two years, show us it's not a fluke. And UCF did that. And yet nothing became of it. So it just, I mean, it just depends, I think. Um, really, like, I mean, I think history is going to follow you wherever, wherever you go, honestly. That, I think that's, like, what that shows. Because you look back at the American, of course, it's a group of five. And then before the American, we have the Big East, where they had teams like eight and four UConn going to the Fiesta Bowl. And people just, they love, they love to bring that up, stuff like that up. I mean, I love it. I think it's funny. Who exactly loves to bring up eight and four UConn? Um, I mean, so there are we was, talking about? Are we talking about a specific group here on Twitter? Uh, <laughs> no, we're not. We're not talking about a specific group. I'll pose another example. But before that, like seven and four Pittsburgh getting absolutely blasted by Utah in the Fiesta Bowl, in the 05 Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> there, there, I'm not targeting any group. I know there's been some past opinions from me about UConn Twitter, but I'm really trying to mend this relationship, frankly, by just staying quiet. <laughs> 
But um, I bring up I bring up another piece of history back then. Like a lot of people don't know that um, pretty much like Florida State saved the ACC if if you really think about it. Well, football wise, of course, because sure. it had a reputation in the '70s and '80s that it developed um, as like the preeminent basketball conference. Like they had, they had a great syndication package. They had they aired their uh, conference championship game before the Super Bowl, like right before the Super Bowl, I believe. Or they had or they had a they had a ATC game that was on stations across the country before the Super Bowl, high profile spot. But football wise, it, it just never was great. Like, um, you look at I look at the 1990 season as a, as an example of that. So the ACC they don't have a bid to any of the major bowls, not the not the Cotton, the Orange, Sugar, the Rose, none of those bowls. Their conference champion goes to the Citrus Bowl. So you look at Virginia, they uh, start off seven and zero under George Welch, Navy grad, Hall of Fame coach, under coach. They start off seven and zero. And the Sugar Bowl, like in a move that was almost unheard of, after the first seven games, they invite Virginia to the Sugar Bowl. They see the opportunity to take them from the Citrus Bowl, which is not really as as lucrative a bowl opportunity, uh, opponent wise and money wise, and they get Virginia in. Well, Virginia loses three of the next four games, so the Sugar Bowl gets stuck with the eight and three team against Tennessee. While Georgia Tech, who upsets Virginia, gets into the title race and. They end up winning the national title at the Citrus Bowl against a Nebraska team that had an off year, but uh, it's still the Citrus Bowl. Like it, it wasn't high profile. So like that that story right there just shows that the ACC was really like honestly it was like it was like the Big East at the time. Like it was like basketball only. It's like basketball focused and um, really just like no dominant programs. Like if, if a program does show up, it's a miracle, you know. And that history thing it still lasts to this day because say like I mean. They, they do have bids to the Orange Bowl, but, um, like, it, it's either, like, this one team or bust, you know, per se. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get that. It's, like, it's real tough, I guess, escaping that, like, getting into that New Year's Six Bowl. It's, like, if you – it's, like, the same exact thing, you know, group of five versus power five, right? Group of five, they get one, one bid to the New Year's Six. Like, that's kind of garbage, right? But it's, like, you get teams like UCF, and they have a bunch of other good teams, you know, that end up going and beating – you know, really strong power five teams in their respective bowls. I mean, it's just the landscape, I think. I think it's kind of like democratized the process a bit with the new playoff selection process, but I think I think more than anything that, that highlights the inefficiencies with the old BCS system. I agree. I think on that point, like the American, with the, the bowl system, at least in the group of five, it's like a lot more wide open um, with like teams playing each other. So like in the next bowl cycle, whenever it starts, might not start 2020, but um, you'll get, like, it's, like, really flexible. Like, uh, looking at the American, like, they're tied to only three bowls. Like, there's only three bowls that they have to send teams to each year, and it's, like, a pool of ten that they send, like, each year. So it's, like, that are flexible. There's, like, better opportunities against fellow group of five schools, though. And that, that's, that's the caveat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I guess, like, uh, in terms of, like, the ACC, like, you step back and look, like, like, yes, they've sent two teams to the New Year's Six, but that's partly because they had to, because they either had Clemson or Florida State in the playoff, and they had to send a team to the Orange Bowl. Like, look at this here. You had eight and four, or you had nine and four Virginia going to the Orange Bowl because they had to. Like, when was the last time the ACC sent, like, an, a legitimate at-large team to either, like, a BCS, t- BCS Bowl or a New Year's Six Bowl? Like, I can't, I can't really remember. I think, um, yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't think it's been, like, in a very long time now that I think about it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't. I'm thinking like there was never really a point, I guess, where in recent memory, at least. So yeah, I mean, it's it's just crazy. Um, well, well, moving on, I guess to our next topic. Um, there was, uh, there's a certain receiver at an ACC school now, uh, Larry Fitzgerald, O3 Heisman um, finalist. Uh, there's a lot of people still talk to this day about him getting robbed of the Heisman from um, against Jason White. Jason White won it that year because he was simply best quarterback on the best team. And it just got me thinking, like, what, what's it going to take for a, a receiver to win the Heisman again? And, like, will we ever see it again? Yeah. I, I honestly, I don't know if we will, especially given, like, how we're starting to look and evaluate, like, our players now. Because, like, when you can start to really quantify the value of each player on the team, so you like look at the quarterback position. It's like you have a good quarterback. That quarterback can add the most like EPA, you know, expected points added, you know, per play, like across all positions, like easily, right? And it's like so he definitely has the most impact on the game. Like despite the fact that you can't really measure a quarterback, in my opinion, versus like wins and losses, 
I think you can't, you can't really debate the fact that a great quarterback is the most valuable asset on your team, right? So it's like any quarterback that is able to like elevate those around them, that is able to go in there and, you know, even just like not turn it over, not play bad. I think they kind of have a, a foot up really on any wide receiver. I think it's interesting too, like how, but I will say that wide receivers are getting madly disrespected. Like, don't get me wrong at all. Because wide receivers can also, you know, elevate their quarterback. I think you look at some at some programs. Like, gosh, man, I had one on mine, but I'm totally blanking on it right now. But if you look, there are instances where the wide receiver like does, in fact, elevate the quarterback. You like look at their efficiency on them versus uh, other receivers on their team, other or other teams that they play on, even. And it's just like the the difference is huge, right? Yeah. And so I think it I think it can go both ways, but I think the difference, like that incremental bit of that, you know, quarterback greatness over the wide receiver greatness, the, the quarterback can elevate, you know, their line, they can elevate all the receivers, they can elevate the running back, they can elevate everyone, right? Because if you make yeah. the defense always play on as they always gotta watch out for you, um, then it's really it's really tough to watch out for everyone else too. So I honestly think that receivers are at such a huge disadvantage. I am not sure that we will ever see that again. Yeah, I think um, on your point on quarterbacks, um, something I saw, like, there's, like, the metrics that show that quarterbacks, like, or that wide receivers can elevate quarterbacks. Like, I saw an article talking about Randy Moss being the pretty much, like, the greatest receiver of all time on the basis that he elevated the quarterbacks that he played with. Like, you look at Dante Culpepper. He was never the same after Randy Moss left for the Raiders. Um, Tom Brady, not so much. But um, who else? Like, um I think, I think there's a stat, too, showing, I think, with, um, I guess, like, Matt Castle. Yeah, Matt Castle. Like, he had a career year, and Randy Moss was was starting um, healthy that whole year. Uh, so, like, I think if, like, we delve in, into those metrics, like, we'll for sure, like, see the value receivers. But I think people, like, it's still, like, a newfound thing with, like, the Heisman voters. So, you still got your, like, run-of-the-mill sports riders who, like, call it as they see it. I do and think that. Oh, okay. no, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, I do think that that kind of highlights another issue in that too many people are still relying on the eye test, you know? Yeah. And I was thinking about it. It's interesting. I, I'm thinking that that's kind of almost leaking, too, into, like, I was looking at the Madden ratings, right? And it's like, you look and you see, like, Larry Fitzgerald nowhere in the top ten, but this dude's been around, you know? Like, obviously, he's getting old, right? You know, he's yeah. not going to be up, up to snuff with some of the newer guys. However, you look over the course of his career, just the amount of disrespect he's really gotten. You know, this dude has more tackles in his career than he has drops. Like, that's yeah, that's incredible. Like, but you've never heard about this dude being really, you know, one of the top wide receiver. Like, he's obviously has been, you know, one of the top, top wide receivers in the league. But even when he's regarded as that, I think it could be, you know, argued that it's disrespect. So I, I just have a little soft spot for Larry right there. Yeah, 100% there. And, like, you bring up the quarterback um, wide receiver disparity. And um, I bring up, like, Larry Fitzgerald. Like, um, I'll bring up, like, I'll compare two cases. So you have Larry Fitzgerald in 03, his quarterback, Rod Rutherford, Real, a real gunslinger, good scrambler, but, like, not not a great quarterback. I think he completed around, like, 50% of his passes, like, somewhere in that neighborhood for uh, 28 scores. Larry Fitzgerald caught 22 of them. Um, so, I mean, it was, like, Larry or nothing, really. Um, and then you compare, like, Mike Evans, a guy who I thought should have been a finalist because he had 279 yards and only seven catches against Alabama. Mm -hmm. He had 287 and four touchdowns against a and But, I mean, you know who his quarterback was. It was, it was Johnny Manziel. So, like, he was obviously being overshadowed there, like, even if the stats and the performances were dominant. So, like, that's, like, that's, like, one part of, the, like, the formula. Like, like you got to obviously be carrying your quarterback, too. And, like, that's, it's, like, the same thing with, like, D.D. Westbrook. Like, he was a finalist. But, uh, I mean, that was Lamar Jackson's year anyway. But, you know who else accompanied him to New York? Baker Mayfield. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, like, it's like you really have to have, like, you really have to, like, it makes it have to be obvious that you're uplifting your quarterback, like, for sure. I think, I think it's tough because I think there's probably an inherent bias because, you know, any player, they have to, their team pretty much has to be undefeated for them to have a chance, right? Yeah. Undefeated one list, or, or sorry, one loss, you know, they have to be really, really elite. The, the whole team has to be elite. And I think it's proven, you know, any player can't, you know, it's like while the quarterback has the effect on a lot of players, I think that, you know, any player can't really affect the outcome of the game, you know, like, like truly carry the team on their back in that sense. So it's, it's really tough in that regard. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought right there. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, you're good, you're good. Um, the, 
What are you talking about? Wide receivers, high receivers. Yeah, about, like the quarterback, like the team has to be good. Um, oh, yeah. oh, right, 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 right. Um, so it's like, so that, that's kind of like the inherent bias, right? Is that your team really has to be, you know, undefeated or one loss. Um, and the quarterback, I think, you know, while no player can really totally determine the outcome, obviously they have the most impact on it, right? So it's like you have a great wide receiver. He can elevate his quarterback when the quarterbacks learn it to him. But, you know, what happens when he has to throw it to everyone else? What happens when he gets double teamed, even triple teamed, and they just lock him down by, you know, tackling him at the line every play? You know, what happens then? His team loses yeah. a few games, right? And it's like, <laughs> at that point, people are going to start saying, oh, how great is he really? But it's like, no, man, it's just due to the position. If you look at relative basis, like the only way to really judge, I think, the Heisman is you have to look at it on a position relative basis, right? Like there's, there needs to be some kind of way to judge it versus like historical, historically, right, for your position. Like there, there, there needs to be an increasing quantum, like obviously in the college game, we just need more quantitative analytics to begin with. Like yeah. the NFL is great in that they divulge so much data. If college could do that, it would probably <laughs> elevate the game, you know, into an insane level. The coaches would be able to start scheming, you know, based on things that we've never even thought about before, honestly. And it, it could just bring, it could honestly democratize the game a bit because you could see strategies that might work much better versus certain, certain spreads in a quantitative sense rather than just some, some random coach saying, oh, I think that worked well, like, once that I remember. Let's run it again and again and again and establish the run and just do stuff that everyone knows doesn't work, right? Yeah, I think on that point, like, um, just, like, being a great team, like, I think they have to be on a national contender because uh, I'll bring up the case. I'll bring up another comparison, I guess. Like, Larry Fitzgerald is a great case, but I'm going to compare him to Desmond Howard, like, too. Um, like, Larry Fitzgerald, dominant year, 22 touchdowns. Um and also, also bring a Randy Moss too for the for that matter because he was a finalist, uh, twenty two touchdowns. But his team was eight and four in the Big East. In the Big East, and this was after like all those guys like left um, Miami. Like Miami was still great, but um, he had his chance really. I, I think I think looking back, Larry Fitzgerald could have won the Heisman in the final week because their last game was against Miami, prime time, ABC, Brent Musburger. Like every everything that screams big game was a part of that game. But Larry Fitz, like Miami shut Larry Fitzgerald down. He only had three catches, and they lost by two scores, or three scores. Like they, they lost by two or three scores, and it's like, yeah, like you can put up the numbers, but you got to come up, you got to like play hard in big games. And like if like if you're not a national contender, you got to play good in big games. And he just he just didn't that game. And uh, no discredit to Randy Ma. I mean, that's no discredit to Larry Fitzgerald, but that was an opportunity that he lost. Like I mean, everything was there. And I think like the voters felt like, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's easier, it's safer if we go with Jason White there this year. And I bring up the same thing with, like, Randy Moss. Like, his stats were just, like, amazingly dominant. Like, he had 26 receiving touchdowns with Marshall, but it was Marshall in the MAC. Like, people recognize this is, like, a generational talent, like a man among boys in the MAC, but they just, they just couldn't give it to him. And I compare those two to Desmond Howard, who was on a Michigan team. I think they, they had one loss, I think. But they were, they were a national title contender. They won the Big Ten. He showed up. Like, they're a national contender. He showed up. And like he had big games against his biggest rivals. He had um he had a touchdown catch. wasn't didn't go over a hundred. Had a touchdown catch against Notre Dame, nationally televised game. Um he um had a touchdown catch against Iowa as well. And then everyone knows about the Ohio State game with the touchdown catch and the punt return. Like everyone knows about that. Like like he showed up in big games for a national contender. And um I think that's like something that, like receivers like have to do. I think if they if they want to win the Heisman, which is like we just like haven't really seen it yet. I guess lately. You think we will see it though ever? I think we certainly will. I mean, like, like look at Mike Evans. Like, he, he had 280 plus um, in a big game. And, like, I think with, uh, I guess, like uh, Nick Rolovich or at Washington State or Mike Leach at Mississippi State, like, you're bringing the, um, like, the run and shoot and the air raid to some big stages. Like, it's only, like, it's only bound to happen where, like, Mike Leach gets in a big game and, like, one of his receivers has an amazing game or, like, Rolo, you know? in the Apple Cup on, like, a, bra on a on a Black Friday, like, on a very light slate. Sure. Like a lot of national attention. Like, uh, one of his receivers – because, like, his receivers at Hawaii put up big numbers, you know? Yeah. Um, John Rusua. I mean, think, guys like him. It, think about it like this, though. So, when you're talking about guys like Randy Moss, like Larry Fitz, right, like any great receiver, really, you think about them really standing out amongst their team, right? So, maybe the qualification for a wide receiver to be considered is not just that they have to be great – it's that they have everyone else has to be really bad, right? Because think about think about lately some of the receivers we've seen, like, you know, just even out of this last draft class, like there's a ton of great receivers, right? Like you look at like CD Lamb, Jerry Judy, like there's just like Alabama's dude pumping out receivers like left and right, right? 
And so it's almost like hard for everyone to judge on a relative basis. They're like, yeah, that, that kid, that kid over there, Julio Jones, man, he was really good coming out of Alabama. But it's like, if every other receiver is also really good, he probably gets discredited even, right? Okay, so it's yeah. It's almost like you need to have a really good wide receiver, elevate everyone around him, and also be on a bad team. Yeah, that that's a good point. Yeah, it's almost like it's almost like a perfect formula. And like, I mean, sort of like another piece of the formula that's being added to is like they have to. I think they have to do a little bit of everything as well. Like uh, you look at D. D. Westbrook, has had 1,500 yards, 17 touchdowns, also had 100 yards, 300 return yards, and a return touchdown. So he did like a lot of other things as well um, for a good Oklahoma team. And I think a guy recently that I thought could have. Uh, Stayed healthy and other stuff ha- like went his way. Other stuff in the formula went his way. Uh, it's Lavishka Chenault out of uh, Colorado. Like he had a thousand plus receiving yards in nine games, five rushing touchdowns. They used him a lot as a, as a wide as a wildcat quarterback. And if Colorado would have not blown twenty eighteen after starting five and zero, like I really think he could have been a Heisman finalist because like it was there. It was like this do everything guy on an upstart team. Like you don't really know about the quarterback. It was Steven Montez, good quarterback, but. Like, I don't think he's, like, top three in the Pac-12, like, that year. Like, it's, like, all the things in the formula were there, but he got hurt and his team lost. Like, like they lost, like, seven straight. Like, so the formula, like, it wasn't there. And, uh, I mean, it, it's just, like, it's, like, coming together. It's, like, a lot of hoops to jump through that we're, like, adding, like, I feel like. 100%. And it's, like, so what does the quarterback have to do? They have to be good on a good team. What does the wide receiver have to do? They have to be great on a bad team, elevate everyone around them, make it so that they don't lose games. Man, that's just – a formula for disaster. And I think, like, one more thing, too, is, like, I think it really has to be a boring year. Like, there really has to be, like, not much of a national oh, title race because oh, yeah. if you look at Desmond Howard, like, the highest the website for all you guys that, wa- that are watching, like, it's an amazing resource. So like, you look at, like, the voting, the game-by-game statistics of a lot of guys, and you just kind of, like, you can kind of get a feel of, like, how the race shaped out. So um, you look at Desmond Howard, that, that was the most uh, – that was the, like, most – the biggest margin of victory for a Heisman winner um, ever, surprisingly. And it was a wide receiver. And you look at the finalists, too. Like, the guys that were one behind him, you had uh, Casey Weldon out of Florida State. Um, like, again, like, national, like they, in fact, Florida State beat Michigan by three touchdowns. But his numbers weren't there. He's just, he was just a good quarterback on a great team. That's all it was. Like, the numbers weren't there. And then you have, I think, uh, finishing third was uh, Steve Entman, the uh, great defensive tackle from Washington, which, like, the, the 19, that 1991 Washington team does not get enough credit as being, like, one of the greatest teams of all time. Like, like, like they outscored opponents on average per game 41 to 9. But, again, this was a defensive tackle. And um, I don't – like, if you're going to give it to a defensive player, it's going to be, like, a guy that, like, whose impact is, like, known, like, almost – like, it's, like, pretty obvious. Like, a guy like Charles Woodson, like, picks off a pass or recovers a fumble or, like, uh, makes, makes, like, a big hit. Like, it's going to be a guy like that, not a guy that gets, like – you know, double team and triple team like uh, Dominican Sue or, or like Steve mm-hmm. Emptman. So like it, it's it's got to be like a and plus two. Emptman was on the West Coast and like West Coast bias is bad now. It was even worse then. You know, um, so like I, I think like that too. Like it's got to be like a really boring year. Like uh, like with like no one exciting. Like um, honestly, maybe, I think. Maybe no, go ahead, just, Maybe this is more a reflection of a uh, of how not necessarily outdated, but. How, how we give way too much, you know, prestige and kind of honor around the Heisman, right? Because yeah. If every other position has, you know, 100,000 hoops, hoops to jump through, you know, relative to like – because, like, obviously offense is at an advantage to defense, right? Yeah. Obviously a quarterback is at an advantage to a running back or wide receiver, right? And so it's like if the, if the playing field is not even, if it is not, you know, relative, like if you cannot truly measure like apples to apples on a player basis, right, using the system, then maybe we should start looking at – like maybe we should not – Maybe we don't have to discount the Heisman, right? But maybe we can start increasing awareness of like other positional awards or like other, you know, lesser known awards that could probably, yeah. you know, measure something that's like a, on a skill level equal to the Heisman. But we just don't give it that same kind of aura around it that we do, you know, for the, the legendary, the Heisman. Yeah, I agree. Like the Heisman was the first, but I've always wondered like why we have like the Maxwell and the Walter Camp Award that are also Player of the Year awards. Like, if they're not getting the same credit as a Heisman, like, why are we even giving them out? Like, I've always wondered that. And that, that's, I think that's a tremendous point that you bring up. No, I completely agree. Maybe if those awards could, like, pivot their focus to, like, maybe maybe if they could somehow quantify their best player award or, like, they, they need to diversify their process a bit differently from the Heisman. Like, I don't know if they already do. Like, I'm not super fluent on it, so I could be wrong. But if they could find a way to, like, truly differentiate their selection process from the Heisman, that could be their key to success. 
Yeah, I agree. I think I think when you bring that up, an award that I've always liked, it, it does have a quantified process, but the Paul Horning Award, the most versatile player in college football, because in the end of the day, like, I think the best player is, like, like a lot that goes into it is the guy that does, like, the most for his team. And, like, you look at a guy like uh, – Lynn Bowden, who I think, who I'm pretty sure, like, if he didn't win it this year, like, then that that's a crime. It's a travesty because, like, he was so – he was pretty much Kentucky. Like, like a guy like Lynn Bowden who returned kicks or anything, your quarterback gets hurt. He starts at quarterback. He runs the ball, like, amazingly. Can throw it – can't really throw it that great, but he, he does what he can throwing the ball. Like, that is a guy that does everything and a guy that should get highest in consideration, like, no matter if his team's, like, seven and five, you know? So, I mean, like, if they followed – I'm not saying the Heisman should become the Horning Award, but if they, like, sort of took that stuff into account other than just, like, MVP of the best team, like, that's, I mean, it's, it's boring. I agree. I completely agree. I guess uh, one question I do have for you is, like, do you think do you think uh, it's becoming, like, sort of, like, harder for a running back? Like, it's – I know it's, like – like, the Heisman's becoming a quarterback award, but do you think do you think that running backs will follow the same, like, path as, like – a wide receiver winning the high I, where it's like a lot of hoops to jump through like now i would have to say so because i think as we're like able to study, you know i keep i keep saying analytics 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 right like as we're starting to understand like real more relative position value i think it's like becoming a lot more clear at least at least to myself and i think some other people in the in the community that you know running backs they're not a dime a dozen right like there are yeah. like some great quarterback like alvin kamar i think is like a great example of someone who can be versatile in both the pass game the run game like that kind of running back is someone that's like extremely valuable right yeah but i think in terms of a running back that you know hasn't really diversified them their skill set as much like there's just there's just really not as much use for them in the new game right and it's, yeah. it's not even that like a great running back can't can't elevate their own game elevate the team's game you know they, they certainly can but I think it's one, you know, so dependent on other positions, like you need a good block in order to truly get down the field, right? And so if you're yes. relying on these other guys, like if they're, if they're just not blocking for you, you'll never be able to show your talent. But beyond that, I think running backs have, you know, you can study the positional value a bit and see that a, a running back that you pay, you know, $100 million a year in the NFL is probably actually pretty statistically equivalent, like on a production basis to a running back who you just got off their rookie contract, right? Or they're, yeah. they're playing on their vet minimum. Like it's like truly – incredible like how how much we value the position or like how much people like give it the eye test and say you know the running back that's that you need that guy on your team but it's like really it, it, it i hate to say it, but it's a little bit more or less replaceable and so i think that's really gonna trickle down and hurt the running back in the heisman process especially right like if we see the position as gaining less and less value um it's just going to be hard for them to really differentiate themselves because we'll say why couldn't that guy like that guy might have been able to do it on his team and this guy could have done it over here and and it just may not be worth as much, like, their position, really. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, um, I do think that college game is different than the pro game in that, like, you do have, like, these workhorses that emerge more so in the pro game. Like, I mean, Chuba Hubbard, um, I mean, Christian McCaffrey, like, guys like that, Derrick Henry. Like, those guys are, like, more prevalent in the, um, in the college game. But, like, of course, like, when people think football, I'm pretty sure the first thing to think of is, like, the NFL. Like, they think the NFL dictates, like, what's happening like what's like the latest trends like strategically uh, and uh when it's like really the opposite at times like like the pro game's taken after the college game but people see it the other way you know so I, I do agree with that a lot I would agree I think I think that's why it's like if you really want to add like if there was going to be a running back in contention it would have to be in a system in which his value is really maximized right which is probably like going back to the last cast you know the option like, I think if there was an option system where a running back truly dominated, that's his offense, right? Yeah. Like, I think that could be a potential. But beyond that, like, if we're running a pro-style offense, like a spread offense, like any other offense, really, it's just going to be really tough for them to differentiate themselves and prove that they do, in fact, carry a large positional value. Yeah, I agree. Like, um, honestly, like, I mean, it doesn't have to be, like, option, like a power running scheme, like, really like Stanford's scheme, like um, Toby Gerhardt and uh, Christian McCaffrey, both the Heisman runner-ups, sure. oddly enough to Alabama running backs. <laughs> but um, like, you, like you see Stanford, like you don't, they're not known for the receivers. Uh, they're known for their power run game. Like there's the meme about them putting 10 guys on the line <laughs> or no, nine guys on the line with a quarterback in the, and the one tailback in the background. Like that's what you think when you think of Stanford, you think of like running back driven systems. And I think those, t those types of teams emerging is like it's like hard like, like you don't really see like teams like that emerging like on the national scale anymore like 
before, like, it was Nebraska. Everyone knew, like, Nebraska was going to run the ball down your dang throat, but Nebraska is not Nebraska anymore. And, like, a team like Stanford, like, they have good years. Like, I mean, they have great years, but being in the Pac-12 hurts a team like Stanford. So, and, like, and then I guess, like, Georgia, too, for that matter. Like, uh, but Georgia's starting to branch out even then, so. I I think that that's kind of a highlight of uh, just, like, the shifting landscape, really, of how we think about strategy in football, right? Yeah, it's like if every, it's almost like a confirmation bias. It's like yeah, if every team is like a power running team, then yeah, power running is the best, right? But when you start introducing that passing and you see like increased, like incredibly increased efficiency, you know, incredibly increased like production, like yards per play, like just like the stats just start going off the chart, right? And it's like it just proves that, like it doesn't necessarily prove that you know passing is like a superior strategy in a hundred percent of instances than running, right? But yep. it's like on a statistical basis you know, your running play on average is going to produce less on average than your passing play. So it's like, it's just tough. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's going to be an uphill battle for, like, running backs and days too, like, with these schemes disappearing. And, like, um, I guess like, there's, like, not really that sort of, like, lineage anymore coming from, like, coaches. Like, um, you don't have that coaching tree coming from, like, Nebraska. Uh, I don't think you have, like, a coaching tree coming from, like, Wisconsin. I don't think anyone's really hiring, like, Wisconsin assistants, too. So, I mean – that game is going to become like bully ball. They call it. It's going to become very, very less prevalent. I think in the game, like hurting running backs, and um, and then too, I guess like that type of running back too, because I guess a Ron Dane type running back, a guy who just like runs the ball, like a huge burly guy, like I don't think that's ever going to happen again. Like I think you need a guy that catches passes too, like you've said, like an Alvin Kamara, mm-hmm. if you're a running back that wins a Heisman too. So it, again, it, like, like you said, a changing of eras, a changing of the guard is occurring too. I agree, man. Any last things you want to touch on there? Um, no, I think we're good. Um, just a teaser for our, for our next podcast. It'll be a very CBS-themed podcast. So uh, you might want to thank the good folks at Viacom for our topic base. Um, I might or might not pull out a, a montage of CBS themes, but I don't want us to get copyrighted. So, <laughs> Well, I think as long as we're not monetizing, we should be okay. That's a good point. Yep. Which it, it's enticing. Might want to monetize it. The thirty-five views. I was. I was the most we had. That was like more than we had in high school. So yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that, that about does it for this one. Yep. You know, um, this is the most awkward sign-off ever. <laughs> we will. We will see you guys back here uh, next cast. Yeah, we'll see you guys. Stay safe. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs> All right, you're still recording, right? Yeah. Here. I'm okay. stopping it now. Do you want me to keep on? No, no, it's all good. All right.